Hey, what's up, Morningstar family? Good to see you guys. Hope you had a great Christmas. We're going to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tonight as a family in communion. Pastor Jack's going to be in Genesis chapter 44 and 45 this evening as we look at the reconciliation uh, that happens finally for Joseph. So it'll be an awesome night of study. And uh, just a, a couple things coming up that we have. Obviously, next Monday, we have our New Year's Eve service. It'll be right here at 7 p.m. Daryl Mansfield will be here in concert. And then likewise, Pastor Jack has a very special message that he's prepared, um, vision for the church and for you in 2013. So we pray that you would be here with us uh, to share that and walk out the door uh, prepared for a new year. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our King, we come before you humbly, and we are so thankful that while we were yet sinners, Christ, you died for us. Our sin that had made us rebellious enemies, you extended your hands in grace, love, forgiveness, and mercy on the cross. A cross meant for us that you gladly wore in joy for the joy set before you of reconciling us to God. We celebrate what you've done. We thank you for our salvation. And it's our heart's desire to spread this message that you've given us to everybody that we see. We pray for the message this evening. Pray that those who don't know you here would meet you tonight. And those of us who do, that we would be ignited to share you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. You guys ready to worship the Lord together? Let's go ahead and stand and let's lift up our voices. He certainly is greatly to be praised, isn't he? Put your hands together. Lift your eyes, lift your eyes to the one who's reigning over us. For he is overcome. Fill the skies, fill the skies with a song. Heaven sings along to glorify the sun. Who is like you? None compares. There's no one like our God. Great and greatly to be praised. Name above all other names. Powerful and strong to save. strong to say hallelujah our God reigns glory in the highest place King of mercy God of grace together let the earth proclaim
Very good. You can be seated. Sits 
his body lay, light of the world by darkness flame, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. Should I sing praise to the King of Kings? 
stand and sing with my voice Lord with my voice Lord I will worship you with my voice Lord I will worship you from silent and reverent hearts that we now come before you and ask humbly that you would teach us through your word, your precepts, your judgments, the way that you would have us go. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good evening. <laughs> Shall I have a good Christmas? How many of you saw Les Mis this weekend? You ready? See? Good, good, good flick. You should go see it. My favorite play of all time. Have, have you seen the play? It's a wonderful story of forgiveness and mercy that uh, Victor Hugo wrote. So it's wonderful. You take your kids. It's clean. I can't never recommend movies because there's always like that one word in there. They're just... But I think this one's fine. All right, say hello to someone sitting next to you. Greet them, and then we'll get started now with our study. Shall we open our Bibles this evening to the book of Genesis, chapter 44, verse 18, as we continue on Wednesday evenings our walk through the book of Genesis. We have about four more weeks, I think, to go. We will do Exodus immediately following. We will also begin on Sunday morning, a week from Sunday, the book of Ecclesiastes. If you've been with us at, at any length as we've gone through Genesis, you know, narrative teachings are, are, are where the lessons are found in, in the picture, in the story. So we tend to go a bit slower because we have to stop and look at the story and ask the Lord, what would you have us to learn? And much of the book of Genesis is narrative. We will get to a chapter here in a little bit where uh, J uh, Jacob sits down in chapter 49 with his boys and he brings words from the Lord to them and it'll be written in the poetic terms, and you can even see it in your Bible, the way that it's written in prose. But, but for the most part, we've, we've been studying narrative, and, and we've spent a lot of time with Joseph. 17 years old, he gets you know, sold into slavery by his uh, brothers who are jealous of him and his visions and his dad's favoritism. He spends 10 years serving as a master of the house, if you will, for Potiphar. Spends three years in prison, accused of rape, something he did not do. And by the time that he is 39 years old, we will find him here in chapter 42 in the second year of the famine. Now, in chapter 41, Joseph had been made second in command in Egypt because God had brought him out of prison when the Pharaoh dreamed a horrible couple of dreams. He didn't know what to do with his uh, magicians couldn't help him. But Joseph said, well, the Lord can help you. And, and he said, God has shown you what is coming, seven years of great abundance followed by seven years of tremendous famine. You should make plans during those seven years of plenty. And, and Pharaoh said, well, who should we put in charge? He looked at Joseph. He said, who's smarter than you has been anointed by God. And so Joseph went from a prisoner in, in a matter of a few hours to vice Pharaoh, if you will. Uh, in, in chapter 42, we, we began a series of studies that really cover one subject. It, it, it is the the revelation of God to Joseph, why all of these years of suffering had come his way. Not that he doubted the Lord, you won't find one place where he did. Not that he questioned God, he did not. But what a blessing after 22 years of, of being mistreated and sold out and sent down the river and, and wondering about your family, that God begins to show Joseph the purposes behind all that he had faced. And so in chapter 42, at the age of 39, he begins to see these past difficulties and years of unfairness, or so it seems, come together. And he begins to see God's plan in all of this. In fact, in chapter 42, Jacob sent his 12, uh, 10 boys minus Benjamin, who was now his favorite, also from Rachel, his favorite wife, uh, Joseph's mom as well. And he sent them to Egypt some 265 miles away, along very dangerous roads with lots of money in hand to buy food for the family because there was no food in Canaan as well. When they arrived, Joseph recognized his brothers. They didn't recognize him. It was a shock to him, but they bowed before him. And it says that Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed back in chapter, uh, or in, in verse, I think, 9 of chapter 42, that he had dreamed 21 years at the time earlier. Didn't reveal himself to them, to them at the time he spoke roughly to them. He wanted to do a couple of things. He wanted to test where their hearts were. He wanted to see if they were sorrowful over what they had done to him. 
He wondered about his father, Jacob, whom he hadn't seen in two decades. He wondered about his younger brother, Benjamin, that he had left behind that he didn't see in the group. And so he began to put tests to them, really to bring them to the place where he might know their hearts before God. So he starts by accusing them of being spies. He threatens to keep nine of them in prison and send one back to find the youngest one that they had already told him was still left and that their dad was good. He kept all of them in prison for three days, brought them all out and said, you know, I, I fear Elohim. That should have maybe caught their attention, a, a Egyptian speaking about the Jewish God. But I'm going to keep Simeon and the rest of you go and I want you to bring that little boy Benjamin back so I might know you're not liars but you're telling the truth. And he picked Simeon who Jacob will say in chapter 49 was the meanest of them all the most mean-spirited one of the, of the group. So he sends the rest home, and while the boys are listening to the orders, they begin to tell one another, you see, this is what happens when we do things that God hates. And God is now getting even for us, for all of the wickedness that we've carried forth. And they begin to talk about how they had treated Joseph, but they spoke in Hebrew, and Joseph had been speaking to them Egyptian through a, an interpreter. And Joseph listens to his brothers talk to one another, believing somehow this was God's payback for their wickedness and selling them off and their lies and all. And it caused Joseph to just weep. In fact, he had to turn away and, and cry. He, he cries, by the way, a lot, Joseph. I think six times in a matter of four or five chapters, we find him over the next several months in tears. His brothers were riddled with guilt, right? They had been carrying this around for, for two decades, and it was almost as if they were waiting for the hammer to drop Joseph wept because he remembered the hard years, but he also listens to their sorrow and suffering, and he knows how much they've been suffering as they face their sins. So he sends them home in the hopes that they will come back. He, he puts money back in the sacks that they had brought to carry the grain and the food home. They discovered it when they stopped to feed one of the donkeys, that one of the bags had money, and the old man were in trouble. But when they got home and began to open all of the bags, each of them had their money returned to them. And they told Jacob the reports of what had been happening and how Simeon had been kept and how the, the man there needed to see Benjamin. And, and Jacob said, I'm cutting my losses. I've lost Joseph. Now I've lost Simeon. I am in no way sending Benjamin. And even Reuben's foolish offer to have his children killed if he couldn't bring them back is just, Jacob, just forget it. Forget it. Chapter 43, 44, and 45, and I, we're right in the middle of that tonight, takes place really all at one period of time as the boys arrive back in Egypt. But we spent last week with the first part of this as the family in Canaan eventually ran out of food and Jacob said, well, go back and get some more food. And they said, yeah, we can't go back. Maybe you remember what we tried last time. You know, we told you about that if, if we don't bring Benjamin, we'll probably die. We shouldn't have waited this long. And so Jacob got mad at his boys and said, well, why did you tell them everything? I mean, why we tell him everything? We want food. The guy asks, hey, you got a dad? You got other, other kids? We just told him. Now he's using it against you. Oh, you guys talk too much. He was angry with them. And Jacob hears Judah stand up and say, look, let me be responsible for Benjamin. I will take responsibility for him. Judah, the one who had suggested that they sell him into slavery, Joseph, years ago. Finally, Jacob relents. He realizes there's really no other way out. He does a little bit of old Jacob and a little bit of, old, uh, of, of new Jacob spiritually. He says, let's get him the best fruit basket we can put together. Expensive at the time. Terrible famine. And, and let's give it to Pharaoh. Maybe we can cull favor with him. Make sure you turn the money back in that they found in the sacks last time. Maybe it was an oversight. And, and then just go. And in the end, in chapter 43, verse 14, he literally says, may, may the Lord go before. And he uses the word Almighty God, El Shaddai. And Jacob throws himself on the, uh, his cares upon the Lord. I, if I'm bereaved, then I'm bereaved. But there's nothing more that I can do. That, that boy is my hope. And now God is as well. So they go back for the second time. Again, 265 miles. This time, double the money. Expensive fruit basket. Dangerous place to be traveling, certainly at this time, with everybody needing so much. And Simeon's been sitting in jail for probably months. You can just imagine how he's feeling. And every day, Joseph, who wants his family back, looks in the line to see if they've returned. Well, finally, the boys came back, money in hand, gifts as well, severe famine. And Joseph sees Benjamin, and when he sees him, he, he immediately says to the steward of his house, take them to our house. Take them to my house. I'm going to have lunch with them 
at the house. And that scares them even more. And they begin to talk to each other. They say, well, it's probably the money. They, they think we're crooks. And so they, they quickly grabbed the steward and said, look, I want you to know we brought, look, at double money. Because somehow last time there was money. We paid money and then there was money. I don't know. And the steward says, well, God must love you because I got your money from last time. He must have blessed you, the God of your fathers. And again, there's that reference to their God that they just seem to miss entirely. So they're welcomed, they're washed, the animals are fed, Joseph comes in, he finds them uh, sitting there together with presents in hand. He asks about Jacob, is, is my father, no, is your father well, he said. And they said, yeah, he's well. And, and so he speaks words of blessing. Is this your young son, uh, Brother Benjamin? Oh, bless you, my boy. That was his only uh, full brother. He, he runs off to weep again. <laughs> because he's seen his brother, who is now probably in his early 20s. When, when Joseph was taken away, he was about one or two. And so he returns, they serve lunch, the boys have to sit at one table, Joseph at another, the Egyptians staff at a third, because it was an abomination for the Egyptians to eat with anybody that they didn't see was like them, like the Hebrews. Joseph sits the boys according to age, which kind of freaks everyone out. He brings them all food from his table, but Benjamin gets five times what everybody else gets. He wants to see if that jealousy is still perpetuating and are they still picking on him because he, he's aware of the fact that Benjamin would have been favored by his father. But everything seemed fine, so they pack up their stuff, get ready, take your stuff home, and they put a silver cup of, of Joseph's, the, the kind that says, I'm royalty, and they put it in his bag, in Benjamin's bag. They let them go for a while, and Joseph says to the steward in his home, go accuse them of taking it. Empty out their bags, and they were stopped, and they all deny it, and may, may the fellow who took it be killed, they say. And boy, they wish they hadn't said that. And from the oldest to the youngest, they begin to empty out the bags, and everything's just good to just have Benjamin to go. And everyone's breathing a sigh of relief, probably a little bit more self-assured, and then out of that bag falls this silver cup. And, and they grab Benjamin, and... Uh, they take him back, accusing him to Joseph of stealing the royal goblet. And everyone comes back with them. They don't all run for their own lives. They go back to secure Benjamin for their father's sake. So everyone returns. And that's where we um, left it last time, tearing their clothes, loading their donkeys, standing together to face the music. In fact, last week... Judah said in verse 16 these words, What can we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? How shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants, and here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. But he said, Far be it from me, Joseph, that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was, he shall be my slave. As for you, you can go to your fathers in peace. Now, as we arrive at our, our, our verses tonight, and I, I want to read verses 18 through 34 with you in one sitting, okay? Because Judah is the guy that has been changed by God the most. And he is going to exemplify the kind of heart that God wants him to have. And it is such a beautiful picture of that which the Lord, I think, would want to work in us. It, it's a good time to you know, to look at these verses on forgiveness, which Joseph exemplifies, God's forgiveness. We're having communion. Aren't you glad that God forgives? Wouldn't communion be the worst if you couldn't get anything there, you know? But you can. And so Judah now stands up. Now, this is the problem. Jacob's home dying if this boy dies. His father's been through it for 22 years. Judah has been responsible for that in many ways. He sold Joseph. He suggested, let's put some blood on his coat. And, and now he stands before someone he doesn't know is Joseph, but he knows there's another brother, and he's going to do it right this time. One way or the other, he's going to get it right. So he stands up, he speaks up. He, it's a dangerous place to be. This is a powerful, worldly ruler. So what can we learn? You know, when, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he wrote, now everything that happened to them happened for our learning as examples to us upon whom the end of the age has come. To the Romans, Paul wrote in chapter 15, whatever things were written beforehand were written for our learning that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures could find hope. So 
You know, it is written is, is, is in oftentimes the New Testament, the Old Testament application in the New Testament. It is written. It was written. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Murphy's Law, right? If something can go wrong, it will. If I wash my car today, it's going to rain tomorrow. Certainly, yeah. But there's another more biblical law that, that we can throw in there. It's called Joseph's Law. Here's Joseph's Law. If something does appear to go wrong, trust God who is behind the scenes doing something good. Romans 8.28, that's Joseph, right? He believes it with all of his heart. I think it was R.A. Torrey who said Romans 8.28 was a soft pillow for tired hearts. Murphy's Law is a pessimistic outlook. I adopt it a lot. Oh, that's just me. I, I always find the one guy going eight miles an hour. I find the guy at the fast food place who gets up to the front and then decides he doesn't know what he wants. Or the person, it'll be eight dollars. Oh, I got money somewhere. Come on, really? You've had 20 minutes to think about this. So I'm forever lamenting Murphy's Law. But that's a cynical law. Joseph's Law is for believers, for us, right? For us. Murphy sees everything on a horizontal plane. Joseph adds God's perspective. He sees the Lord in the midst of it. And even when for years, and I mean years, 22 of them to be exact, when he cannot fathom what God is doing, he is one of those amazing saints who realizes God is in charge, his plans will be glorious, he'll rest in him before he sees them worked out, but he's hearing them worked out here. And not only is his family back, but he's the reason they're going to be saved. God sent him ahead, and all he needs to do is forgive, and he's more than willing to do that. There's no struggle with him at all. But this must have blessed his heart as he hears these men speak, and especially Judah step up on behalf of his brother and on behalf of his father to be willing to take the punishment. Let me take his place. In fact, he says that in verse 14 and 15. He's like, let me take his place. Let, let me suffer. And Joseph, that's not right. That's not fair. I, I just want the man who, who committed the sin to suffer, the one who stole the goblet to suffer. And so the speech of Judah overwhelms Joseph as he hears for the first time how much his father loved him, as he hears how sorrowful he was when he thought he was dead. He hears what the boys told dad about his disappearance and the guilt that they had all been carrying for 22 years. It is a heartfelt plea. And Joseph finally hearing what the boys say understood that their grief was real. Even if it meant they would lose their own life, they were not about to do this again. So here's what, here's what Judah says to his brother, though he doesn't yet know him, obviously. Verse 18. Judah came near to him and he said, Oh, my Lord, please, let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father an old man and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead. He alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. And you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I might set my eyes upon him. And we said to my Lord, The, Lord, the, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. And so it was. When we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord, and our father said, go back, buy us a little food, and we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. And your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Therefore, when I came to your servant, my father, and the or when I come to him, and the lad is not with me, since his life is bound up in that lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave, for your servant became surety for the lad to my father. And I said, if I do not bring him back, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go with his brothers. For how shall I go up 
to my father, if the lad is not with me, perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. Now that's a different guy than Judah going, let's sell that little sucker. Put some blood on his jacket and tell daddy he die. Quite a different guy, huh, these 22 years. I mean, his heart has been touched and it has been changed. I want you to notice that his understanding as well as ours of Jacob's um, relationship with these boys through his favorite wife, Rachel, hadn't changed much. He hasn't quit playing favorites, though he was from a family that did, and, and he carried it into his own. It had been nothing but trouble. He had so loved Rachel and those two boys, Joseph and Benjamin, that he just separated them in his heart. And, and notice that even after 22 years, Jacob hasn't gotten over the grieving at all of the death of, of what he believes to be Joseph which is why he is now inseparable from Benjamin, who I suspect is being suffocated by this. 22 years old, you know, don't go, on the, don't go on the street, don't get hurt, don't go too far away from home. He's 22. But dad is not letting him go, right? Because he hasn't learned to grieve. He's been paralyzed by it. He stopped living. And, and it certainly sets before us a, a man, Jacob, who, who didn't let God handle these things in his life. He's not gotten over it. You know, we, we know folks that have had someone in their family die, whether it's a child or a, or, or a, or a spouse or, or a parent, and they never seem to get beyond it. You know, you can counsel them all you want and support them all you like, but until they're willing to let go and let God be God and rest in his care, it's not going to get any better. You know, most folks, when, when people die, grieve, and grieving usually starts with denial followed by shock, sometimes anger. They're angry at God. Why did you take my life, my friend's life, my wife's life, my child's life? Or they're angry at the person who died. How could you leave me alone? And sadness and depression and all, but there's always that slow learning to cope. You move on, you know. You have, you have hope, not like those who have no hope. But somewhere along that, that line of, of adjustment, people, they stop, they check out, they shut down, they... They die themselves. And, and you can see it in Jacob. It's a pretty unhealthy paralysis. But his son cares for his father. Didn't before. And so now he's making a plea to a man that he has no idea who he is. You know, some bigwig Egyptian ruler, like the Pharaoh, can live or die by his word. And he pleads for him so that his father wouldn't have to suffer any more than he already has. So it's a great turn in his heart. And one... That, that comes from a fellow who, who, let's not kill Joseph, then we've got no gain. Let's sell him and pocket the profit. And, and Judah shares his promise to his father to be responsible for Benjamin. He offers to be the substitute, even as our Lord does for us. If I don't bring him back, it's going to kill my father. Now, you're Joseph. You, you're on the other side of this equation. What would this do to you? Because finally you get what you need, the proof of their sorrow over their sin, of their love, how the jealousy has gone out the window, and it was more than he can handle, and so he has to let himself be known now. He can't play the charade anymore. There's nothing now to be gained. Before we turn, though, and finish the chapter and go down to, uh, through chapter 45, there, there's something to be said about maintaining relationships that, that this family's not very good at. And I think we've pointed it out to you three or four different times as we've gone through uh, the book of Genesis that, that, you know, relationships tend to be very fragile anyway, but they're precious. And sometimes a, a word spoken in anger or bitterness can sever a relationship and it can last for generations. I, I've been to a lot of hospital rooms and to a lot of accident scenes and to a lot of funerals and heard a lot of people grieving about what they should have done. I wish we had time to, to forgive. I wish we had time to have called. I wish we would have not said what we did. And they're remorseful words that they, they can't be undone. And I watched Judah, who for 22 years has just been dying, and now it's his, one, it's his one opportunity to play the hero, for his father's sake. A, an actual act of love, finally from a boy who hadn't been that close to his father. So, if anything, you know, may the Lord teach us as we have communion tonight that you should probably just get over your grudge. And, and you should probably just swallow your pride and make it right. And, and like Joseph, who will forgive them genuinely 
You know, and it's a, it's a forgiveness that's rooted in God's love, and he knows God's love. Joseph's been the recipient of all the wickedness, but he doesn't feel that way. He feels like God's loved him and watched over him and, and will use him. So do your best to cherish the relationships that you have. This family's terrible at it. You know, heinous sin, two decades of suffering, enormous grief. But it doesn't hold Joseph. He's free from all that. These, are the guys, these guys are all weeping because they've done the wrong thing. Jo- Joseph's weeping because he realizes what God is doing. He, he's, those, these are tears of great joy and relief and, and thanksgiving. So much so that when Joseph turns to forgive these guys, it is such a kindness to them that their guilt makes the love of Joseph seem absolutely uh, surreal, unbelievable. Kind of like how you feel when you go and get saved. I can't believe you're actually going to forgive me. But God does. So we read in verse 1, chapter 45, Now Joseph then could no longer restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, Make everyone go from me. And so no one stood with Joseph as he made himself known to his brothers. He sends out the Egyptian servants. He puts out the interpreter. He pulls off that fake beard of horsehair. He starts talking to them in their own language. And I'm sure that they're going, oh, this can't be true. This is weirder than weird now. They'd only known him as the Lord of Egypt with great power. And now they see who he is. This is Joseph. And Joseph's love for them, his, his joy in seeing Benjamin, his, his joy in hearing of his father, the willingness on the part of their brothers and Judah to protect this young boy and to serve their dad was exactly what he wanted to hear. So off comes the headdress and off comes the disguise and And weeping yet again, he reaches out to them. In fact, verse 2 says, They wept so loud that the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard about it. Oh, the doors were shut, but the noise wasn't kept out. Twelve grown men crying like little babies. Joseph sheds tears of joy. It's kind of like that scripture about there's joy in the presence of one angel over one sinner who repents. Here's a whole room full, you know? And the estrangement is over, and the Enmity has been removed. And and verse 3, Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? He's not sure they're telling the truth yet. But his brothers could not answer him, for they were just dismayed at his presence. They were in shock. They were speechless, troubled, alarmed. The word dismayed means to be disturbed. You can just... Frozen in time, right? And so Joseph says to his brothers, Please come near me. And so they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. God sent me before you to preserve your life. They couldn't get it together. They were just freaked out. There's a, the Hebrew word nagash means draw near or literally look into my eyes. And I think Joseph just went to all <laughs> It's me, the guy with the dreams. The fellow you let cry when you're sitting eating your lunch. Don't be angry with yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. You might have sold me, God sent me. See, there's Joseph's outlook. Don't you think that's great? And he mentions it to focus them on the Lord and his work rather than upon their failure. Look, you you sinned, but God had a plan. And I love how, how Joseph sees God's sovereignty overruling the actions of men so that even the, the wrath of men will bring praise to God which is a verse in Psalm 76, verse 10, I think. So Joseph speaks, but notice verse 5, not in anger. He's not angry. He wants to comfort his brother. You don't have to be mad at yourself. I know what you did was wrong, but God had a hand in this, and he took what you meant for evil. He turned it around. Joseph has this wonderful hand of grace. How can you be forgiving? You can be forgiving when your eyes are on the Lord. I know what you did was wrong. You tried to hurt me. You tried to kill me. You tried to take money from me. You tried to hide my disappearance, but God sent me. He has a plan. He wants to save our family. This is the way he chose to do it. Now, this isn't the response in verse 5 of the average person, would you say? But Joseph's hardly an average person. And the only way he comes to this is after 22 years of, of being convinced that God was still ruling and that not everything was lost. But he didn't see that until right now, until he saw these boys, until he heard their story. Now he gets it. But he was willing to let God be God even if he didn't get it for all of those years. So God wants to save our family. I've been sent ahead to make that happen. I get it now. 
But you see, here's, here's his theology, verse 6. For these two years the famine has been in the land. There's still going to be five more years in which there'll be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here but God. And he has made, a father to Pharaoh, made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord over all of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. See, Joseph looks at every consequence of, of difficulty as God had a plan. You and I usually look at consequences of difficulty and we go, oh, uh, Murphy's Law. Right? Not Joseph's Law. This is Murphy's Law. If it can go bad, it's going to go bad. I, get in the, I always say to my wife, we get in line to go like, buy something. I go, okay, which line? Because I'll pick the wrong one. We went to the movies last night. I went to see the Lady Miserable. I had 15 lines of people buying popcorn. I said, okay, which line? She said that one. I said, yeah, okay. I got in that line. We waited the longest. Everyone went, whoosh. We had some lady up in front going, could I have the specials again? I don't know about the specials. Now if I get the popcorn and the, could you hurry, please? <laughs> and I waited. To me, everything's Murphy's Law. To Joseph, everything's God's Law. Who are you more like, me or Joseph? Me, all of you. Every last one of you. <laughs> but I love the vertical component. If you can live your life knowing that God is in charge of your life and that God is fulfilling his purposes, then you don't have to say to somebody, you messed things up for me. Or everything would have been fine if it hadn't have been for. Because God has a plan. So, so temporary difficulty was nothing compared with the glory that would follow. Here's what... Psalm 105 says about some of Joseph's life in prison. This is now written in Psalm 105. This is said, it says this. He called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all of the provision of bread. Speaking of the Lord, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time his word came to pass, and the word of the Lord tested him. And then the king sent and released him, and the ruler of the people let him go free, and he made him lord of his house and ruler over his possessions to bind the princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. But how did God bring them around? He, he put Joseph in prison where his feet hurt from the chains and where he had to lay bound and suffering and tested. Was he really going to believe that God was good? The word of God was testing Joseph. He came through with flying colors. Me, Murphy's Law. I'm the Murphy Law complainer. I feel all right telling you that because I know you all are the same way. <laughs> Yet God help us to be more like Joseph. To be able to go, all right, Lord, I don't get this. And this person's wicked. And that lady should have had her money ready at the beginning of the line. She should know popcorn or no popcorn. <laughs> but I'm going to look to you. Wouldn't that be a better way to live for us? This was no country club these last 22 years. These were hard labor with chains that tore his flesh. I don't know how long you would have lasted before crying out, I don't believe in God anymore. But it was a test of faith. And, and, and Joseph continued to believe God was with him and that God was working out a plan because he doesn't make his children suffer needlessly. But he didn't see it for 22 years, and now he gets it. And the first words out of his mouth are, you bunch of dirty rats, which might have been good. And I'm keeping all of you in jail for 10, 20 years, and then we'll, we'll talk. He just said, don't be mad at yourself. I know what you meant to do, but look what God meant. Don't be grieved. Don't be angry. You sold me here. God sent me here. And God wanted to spare you. It, it's not you, ultimately. It's him. He's in charge. He, he oversees all of these things. If you can come to realize from Joseph's story that, that nothing and no one can hinder the plans of God for your life, then you can rest. Simple as that. If you can know that, people won't bother you, situations won't upset you, you know, unplanned occurrences won't slow you down. We often try to blame other people for our troubles. You know, if so-and-so hadn't done this, or if so-and-so hadn't said that, then everything would be well and all. But aren't you giving so-and-so a lot of credit then? They can actually derail in your life the plans of God, so-and-so. We might want to get to know so-and-so. They're pretty powerful. To think they could actually interfere with the will of God for your life by their actions. No way. You know, when, when, the, when the church was young, we, we rented the school over here on Santa Gertrudis, 
And, and the Lord gave it to us after we had looked at every place in town. And I finally went to, a, to, to talk to the school board guy up at the city. And it was his first day, new guy. And I took coffee and I had a white shirt on and I got nervous and I spilled coffee on my white shirt. Well, I wasn't nervous, but I was foolish. I was sitting around, oh, there you go, great. And then he calls me in and goes, hey, nice shirt. And I go, dude, I spilled the coffee, it was an accident. So he starts questioning me about the church. Well, what do you guys believe? Well, what do you guys teach? Well, what do you think about the Bible? I'm thinking, really? So I'm thinking, what does he want to hear? Well, I just tell him what I think. It turned out he had come from Calvary Costa Mesa. He had been placed there in a job just for six weeks. He gave us the place to meet in the school, and then he left. So God brought this guy in, which was pretty cool. So then the school comes to us and says, well, you've got to get out because, you know, we're, um, we're going to reinstitute the school, and we're going to put it back online and all. It's going to be reactivated, and you have this, this much time to relocate. And everywhere we went, we couldn't do a thing. One of our board guys who has since gone to be with the Lord called me one night, and he, he's the closest thing to a prophet I've ever met, this man who was with us at the beginning. But he, he said, hey, I was praying for the building. I said, oh, good. He said, the Lord told me to tell you to quit looking. I go, yeah, that's not the Lord, is it? We got like 12 weeks. And he said, no, I believe the Lord doesn't want us to, to look anymore. I went, all right. And it was kind of a relief because we hadn't really know else to look. So we stopped looking, and then we get a call from a guy that was in this place on this facility, and he he said, would you like to rent from us? I said, no, I'd like to buy from you and you can stay rent free as long as you like. How would that be? And he went, oh, that'd be good. So in a matter of two weeks, we bought the place. And the Lord just worked the thing out, but it was so frustrating until you begin to realize that God has a timing and a purpose and a plan. It eventually becomes clear. And then I thought, man, what a great God. And I looked back and I thought, man, Murphy's Law all day. Went to 10 places, nothing works, never, ever, ever, anything works out for me. And then the Lord does this thing. Oh, I'd just rather be Joseph. That Murphy's got to go. So I, I, I'm great at faith when I look back. <laughs> My faith is best when I look back. Joseph sees the plans of God and the suffering years swallowed up in joy. If God be for us, who can be against us? Isaiah 54, verse 17 says that no weapon formed against you will prosper. That this is the heritage of the saints of God. That our righteousness comes from him. So Joseph tries to comfort brothers that are now both terrified and, and guilty and, and not sure what to do with his mercy and grace which they're facing in his life. Verse 9, hurry up and go to my father, Joseph says, and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt, so come down to me, don't tarry. You can dwell in the land of Goshen, you shall be near me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. And I will provide for you, lest you and your household and, and all who you have with you come to poverty, for there is still five years of famine. Behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. She tell, tell my father of all the glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. And he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept again. <laughs> and Benjamin wept on his neck and he kissed all of his brothers and he wept over them. And after that, his brothers all of a sudden were able to talk to him finally. Come and see my glory. Let me take care of you. Come dwell with me. I get now what God wants to do. Don't die in poverty and in famine. Come stay here. And with a great joy, he weeps with them. He shares the love of God with them. He loved them as God would, shows them real grace, and invites them to come to Goshen to live. Now, if you get a map out, you can find that Goshen was the, the most fertile area in all of the land of Egypt. It was right where the delta, the Nile Delta, which measured about 9,000 square miles, so twice the size of L.A. County. And there's only 70 guys going to live there. Seems to be plenty of room. <laughs> So notice in verse 15, finally the boys come around. I don't know how they apologized or hugged or, or looked away or what relief from all of the nightmares, you know. I, I imagine it feel, felt a lot like the day you and I were saved. When you went home that first time, go, ah, oh, I am saved. And you knew it. I think these boys were, man, that big load off their shoulders. Well, the report of it, verse 16, was heard in Pharaoh's house, and they said, Joseph's brothers have come. And it pleased the Pharaoh and his servants as well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, well, tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan, bring your father, bring your household, come to me, I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can eat of the fat of the land. And 
you are commanded to do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. And don't be concerned about your goods. For the best of all of the land of Egypt is yours. Now, if you were Joseph and you had Murphy's Law driving you, the Pharaoh wouldn't like you like this. Because you'd be the complainer, the griper, the I don't deserve to be here. I've spent three years in prison. Man, I'm going to get my e get even someplace. You'd be complaining constantly. What has Joseph done? He's loving the Lord. What, what, what takes place around him? Even the Pharaoh, the Egyptian idolater, loves Joseph. And if this is Joseph's family, then it's my family. And he welcomes them with open arms because Joseph has been the blessing of God upon the nation. He provides first-class transportation, got them Egyptian carts, the latest innovation. They're going to go get dad, and they're not going to bother to bring their old... Don't bother to bring your goods. Forget your old stuff. we got better stuff here in Egypt. You leave the flat screen at home, and you, <laughs> you come get one here. So notice he says to him, this is what I command you to do. Verse 20, this is, or verse 19, you're commanded to do this. this is, don't, don't worry, Joseph. And Joseph wasn't a guy that took advantage of things. But, but the Pharaoh commanded him, take advantage of my provision. And so verse 21, the, the sons of Israel did so. Joseph gave them the carts according to the command of the Pharaoh. He gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, a change of garment. Um, Actually, it says changes of garments, plural. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. Because that's his buddy. And he sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and food for his father for the journey. And they sent the brothers away and they departed. And he said to them, now see that you don't become troubled along the way. The, the clothing was a mark of wealth in the Bible today, certainly a change of clothes. I, I'm interested that, that Joseph said, don't, don't fall into trouble along the way. The word is, for, is the word perturbed or, or squabble. And it literally seems to say, Joseph said, now don't fight with each other on the way home. Don't let this slow you down. Uh, guard your temper, you know. It, it, it's over. You know, don't try to blame each other. Don't try to point fingers. Just go home and come back. Let this thing go. Well, they get home, verse 35, they went up out of Egypt and they came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father, and they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he's governor over all of the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. I, I like the thought, I'm sure that Jacob hearing them coming went outside and I don't know, his eyes weren't that good, but I'm sure the minute he saw Benjamin and Simeon, he figured, all right, we're good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, twelve. Oh, good, twelve. And they got a lot of stuff. Where did they get all them carts? Cool little tinted windows and <laughs> dingle balls in the bag. But when they got closer and the news came that Joseph wasn't dead, he was alive. And they'd only suggested he is that here's his coat. It had blood on it because he, we think he's dead. Jacob just about dies himself. The word there in verse um, 26 that Jacob's heart stood still, literally are the words, his heart became numb. So he doesn't believe what he heard, and yet when he sees the donkey, he sees the carts, Benjamin goes, no, Dad, for real, it's Joseph. He looks just like me. we got to go there. That Jacob's, verse 27, when they told him all of the words which Joseph had said to them, when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived, and Israel said, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I'll go, and I'll go see him before I die. I love this story. What a cool deal. Old Jacob is finally going to get over his grieving. Now, we're going to continue next week, but before we quit tonight, let's talk for a couple of minutes about forgiveness, because it is certainly one of the themes of, of Joseph's life, the, the ability to forgive. We're having communion tonight. We hope God means it, don't we, when he says, I'll forgive you. Because if he doesn't, guess what? You're all in trouble. All right, we're all in trouble. Forgiveness, first and foremost, is a choice. It is a choice that is based upon God's word to you. If you base forgiveness on feelings, you'll never get there. Because feelings are hurt, Feelings are betrayed. Feelings will let you down. Feelings will justify the I was taken advantage of. 
Feelings can't do it. You've got to choose. Joseph felt, he could have felt really bad looking at these guys now on their faces going, I told you when I was dreaming this was going to be right. He could have done a lot of I told you so's, but he didn't. He chose to let God be God. Oh, Lord, <laughs> you were in charge when I was getting ripped off, and this is the plan that you had. Feelings won't work. If you wait for other people to repent before you forgive them, that won't help either. If you say, well, I'll forgive them if they say sorry in a way that I think they mean it. No, 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 that won't work. I remember going out and, and meeting Corey Ten Boom when she used to come out to Costa Mesa in her later years of life, and she would actually a couple times came out to the Sunday evening services at Costa Mesa and just read the Bible in her little Dutch accent. And since I was born in Holland, I always you know, enjoyed her more than maybe most folks. Um, but her family were, were, were Christians, and they lived... Uh, above a jewelry shop in Harlem in Holland. And during the war, her dad, who was a watchmaker, began to hide the Jews in the walls of their house to try to keep them from the Nazis. And they were caught, and the family together sent to a concentration camp, and, and many of her family died there. Well, she made it through years of harsh treatment. And years later, while she was out on her speaking tour later on in her life, there was a man who walked up to her after she had spoken and stuck out his hand and said, would you forgive me? And she recognized him as being the chief guard that had watched over her and her family and put several of her family members to death. And he appeared at a meeting. Now, I don't know how you would feel about that. But let me read to you what she wrote as she was confronted with this guy. This is what she shared. I, I stood there with my... With, sorry, I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. I know that will can function regardless of the temperament of the heart, and I prayed that Jesus would help me. Woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out, and I experienced an incredible thing. The current started in my shoulder, raced down into my arms, and sprang into our clutched hands. This warm reconciliation seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with my whole heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoners. I have never known the love of God as intensely as I did at that moment, because to forgive is to set a prisoner to free and to discover that that prisoner was you. So, pretty rough thing to do, don't you think? But I, but I look at Joseph and I think, you know, these boys walked out of that place free that day because Joseph was right with God. It only took one guy. And Joseph grew another foot in my appreciation of him. You know? You look at Joseph, oh, he's a, he's a monster in the Lord. No, he's even bigger. He's even more than that. What, what a shock it was for them to be forgiven. What a shock it is when I discovered God wanted to forgive me. Not that he would, but that he wanted to. I think that moved me more than the fact that he would. Because I figure God could do whatever he wants. But when he wants to, he wants to forgive me. Come on, Lord, forgive me. You don't have to beg. I want to forgive you. Well, that's the kind of thing that I, I'm reminded of constantly as we you know, have communion. God wants to forgive. That's why we have communion. That's why he says, celebrate this sacrifice so that you might know my heart. Do we deserve it? No. Did Joseph's brothers deserve it? No. Did that, that Nazi SS guy from the concentration camp deserve it? Absolutely not. But God wants to give it. Father, thank you tonight as we sit together that you are a God who longs to forgive. And may we learn from Joseph not just the idea of your forgiveness for us being willing and, and, and constant, but Lord, may we learn from Joseph that when there are no explanations for the difficulties that we face, the comfort that we have is that the minute our lives are surrendered to you, it is no longer some happenstance or some kind of fortune or luck or good turn of events or just a constant law of Murphy. But Lord, rather, you have promised to, to go before us, to prepare a place for us, to go and lead the way that we might follow, to prepare us for the place you are preparing for us already. That, that nothing escapes you, that no one can defy you, that no, no individual or circumstance or person can keep us from God, what you want for us in our lives, that, that the only hindrance that will come from us discovering your will is going to come from us because you're willing 
And if like Joseph, we'll surrender, we'll die to ourselves, live for you so that it's not always about what we want, but rather what do you want? That we can find tremendous joy and have great impact and be greatly used, even as Joseph was. Tonight, as we, we're, we're going to serve you communion, and some of our bookstore workers are going to come and share with you and bring you the, the cup and the bread. But look, if tonight you are here still under the weight of sin, aware, really, of your failure, but wondering how in the world can you make it right, know this, you can't, but God already has. And much like these boys who came to Joseph, who waited to reveal himself to them until they admitted their failure and sin, so God has been watching over you so that you could come to a place where you could confess your sin and he could reveal himself to you as your savior. And then he'll take your sin, he'll take the burden, he'll send you home with peace, with joy, blessed, greatly blessed with a wonderful future. If you don't know the Lord tonight, then before you have communion, would you, right where you're sitting, ask the Lord to come and forgive you. Confess to him that you aren't able to please him on your own, that the, that the burdens of sin and trying to hide it or bear up under it or make excuses for it, it just doesn't work. There's no peace in that arrangement, no rest for the heart. But you're willing to just say, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus, thank you that you came to die for me in my place, to take the burden of my sin. And if you'll pray that prayer, God will save you tonight from sin, from your, from your past, from, your, from the old nature, from the old life. And he'll give you his spirit to dwell within you, and he'll begin to work within your heart. And he'll save you. He'll save you and make you new. And then you can have communion with us because the Lord gave this to the people of God, to the church, to his children to remind them, first of all, of where their, their, their forgiveness comes from and, and the grace that God gives us, the payment that he made. And then he has us looking forward to his return because this life is not it. It doesn't end here. This is just the beginning. So pray, Lord, save me. And then after we have communion and we dismiss, the pastors will be up front. It would be good for you to come and just tell them, hey, look, I pray to receive the Lord tonight. And if you, if you don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. If you, if you have one, we'll give you some Bible studies to take home so that you can take God's word for it, not mine, but you can search the scriptures to see if those things are so. So would you sit and worship together as the worship team leads us? And the, Let's wait till everybody's served with the bread and with the cup, and then we'll, we'll partake together.
Father, tonight as we sit together, it is with great joy that we, we think about the forgiveness that you have brought to us through your son. Much like Joseph's brothers, they certainly deserved worse, far worse, for the grief and the hurt and the lies and the, the deception that they harbored for so long. And we're not much different, Lord, when it comes to you. We, we say things we mean towards you and then and go do what we really mean somewhere else. And yet you have sent your son to save us. While we were yet sinners, you died for the ungodly. So Lord, tonight as, as your people, your children, we, we thank you, Father, that you chose to love us when we chose to hate you. And that you chose to forgive us when we chose to try to deceive you and use you for our own benefit. And tonight we're products of God's love, God's grace. And Lord, for some that tonight 
This is their first night as, as children of the kingdom, children of God. Remind us, Lord, again, as we hold the cup and the bread in our hands, that because of you, we have hope. This isn't the end of our life. This isn't the end of days. This is just the beginning. There's an eternity waiting for those who have trusted in you. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So, Father, we give you tonight our lives. We thank you for saving us. We come to worship you. And as we have communion, we, we, we pray that you'd remind us again of what you were willing to pay to set us free. Let's hold the uh, bread up before the Lord tonight. Beth Day is going to come and lead us in a prayer over the bread. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Abba, we come before you and we want to hallow your name. We want to lift you up. We want to glorify you. We just look to you, Lord, and we just surrender to your will and what you have done. You've been so patient with the world. You've been so patient with us. You sent your son, Lord, at just the right time into the world, and you sent him into our lives at the right time too, to bring us salvation, Lord, Bless to forgive you. us. And I just want to remember, Lord, that you said that you gave us this bread, that this bread was a remembrance, that your body was broken for us. Dear Jesus, thank you. Or take together, shall we? Thank you, God. Praise you, God. Shall we hold our uh, cups up as well as the Lord, after supper, bless this third cup of the Passover feast. He spoke of, of, of his blood being shed for our sin. New covenant. Glenn Kovac's going to come and lead us in a prayer over the cup. Abba, Father, we are so amazed at your love for us. Yes, God. Father, that you would send your only begotten Son to pay the price of, of sin, Lord, the penalty that we could not possibly pay. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for enduring the shame, the mockery, the humiliation, the, mm -hmm. the beatings, yes. for enduring the cross, Lord, and putting an end to an all that we might have hope and our hope is in you, Lord Jesus. Mm. So, Lord, we do this in remembrance of you. Yes. Partake. Don't you love being on this side of forgiveness? <laughs> now to go forgive as he's forgiven us. Shall we stand together? For those of you that prayed to receive the Lord tonight, our pastors will be up front after the service. Would you please come tell them? Look what God is doing in my life so we might pray for you. I want to remind you next Monday night, our New Year's Eve uh, service starts at 7. Uh, Daryl Mansfield is going to bring his whole band out here and rock out. It'll be great. We'll be having a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. So um, let's pray together after we sing this last song, and then we'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday as well. Every generation, to every generation, sanctuary from the storm. To every generation, to every generation, Lord. Sing that again. You have been. You have been a shelter, Lord. To every generation. To every generation, sanctuary from the storm. To 
to every generation, to every generation, Lord, to every generation, Lord. And Father, as we leave this place tonight, we realize because of your grace that there is no record of our wrongs before you, that our slate is clean, white as snow, that you've come to reason together with us. You paid the price. We get the benefit. You get us. We get you. And so, Lord, tonight, may we learn from Joseph and the narrative that you set before, the story that contains the lesson that we are supposed to live our lives knowing, God, that you're sovereign over our lives, that you'll take care of things, that no one will get in the way of what you want to do with us, so we can rejoice at all times. And secondly, Father, that we need to forgive, even as we've been forgiven. Help us to do that this year. May we more than ever be men and women of God who are able to forgive from the heart. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Oh, by the way, poinsettias, we don't need them. You want them, come get them, or they're going to get, you know, 86. Okay, God bless you guys.